Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. It's great to be here with you. My name is Amy Rifat. I am a private sector specialist with IFC's employability program, Vitae, and I will be moderating this uh, webinar. Today, we want to talk to you about the important topic of career services. Um, <clears throat> the career services at any institution is uh, provides a vital link between a student's present life, i.e. They're, they're studying for a diploma or a degree, and their future life, uh, their work, and uh, the way they're going to make a living in the future. And we know that you, our audience, uh, cares about uh, this the most, your students, and them getting a good job and ultimately leading a, 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 good, a good life. Um, the question is how, as an education institution, uh, can you go about doing this? In this webinar, we uh, plan on providing you with valuable information, tips and resources on uh, moving forward on your career services uh, offered students, regardless of where you are on your journey uh, on this, whether uh, even if you haven't even set one up, uh, this webinar will still help. We have selected uh, our speakers based on their extensive experience in this space. And I am delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Fundi Nafamela, the director of the Cooperative Education at Mongasutho University of Technology, or MUT. Um, she also serves as the general secretary of the South African Society for Cooperative Education or what is referred to as SASKI. Uh, Fundi has completed her doctorate in education with a focus on students and graduates level of readiness as they transitioned from education into the world of work. Uh, crossing the ocean over to the US, uh, we have Jim Burney. He has taught and provided career advice to Washington University students, alumni and colleagues for 18 years. He has been a member of the Global Curriculum Innovation Advisory Board of the Future Talent Council, the National Association of Colleges and Employers, and he was the past Associate Dean of the Olin Business School and Director of several university career centres. And I think you'll be interested to know that he's also worked in Africa, uh, so in, in our region here, with education institutions to build career service units. I'm sure you will have questions for our speakers, so I encourage you to um, write in your questions in the chat or the Q&A box, and we will have a, a Q&A session at, towards the end of our webinar. Now. <laughs> Before moving on to our discussion, we have a question to you for you to better understand um, who's <clears throat> in the audience today. Now, the question is, does your education institution, um, <clears throat> and it's going to show up on the screen now, have a career service unit or what you may be calling a cooperative education unit? Um, yes. No, or um, yeah, um, yes, we have. Uh, we uh, no, or no, we don't. We we don't. We we don't have a unit, but we provide services in an informal way, not through a dedicated uh, unit. So, <clears throat> while uh, you, the audience, uh, provide your answers on that, and we'll we'll be. Um, uh, talking about that, I would like to start our discussion. I'd like to start with Jim first. Um, Jim, could you tell us what exactly career services is? Like, how would you identify it? Because there are many things associated with this and mainly getting an internship and writing a CV. Well, I think in the, thank you, Amy. I think in the past, uh, people would think of the career services concept and think, I've got to get a resume, I've got to get my CV, I have to get a job. But the fact of the matter is there's a lot of pedagogy behind this, and it's a very important skill to be taught and for students to learn about who they are, what their interests, their values, their uh, personalities like. 
uh, how they represent themselves, how they present themselves and communicating um, who they are, what they're looking for, and also understanding the marketplace. Who would pay them to do certain roles? So uh, this has developed from a, a, in the 20, 30 years ago, a bolt on job shop, possibly uh, right before graduation to now in in many places, a very integrated pedagogy that is delivered from the very beginning of a student's journey through their education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, what you're uh, uh, so it's it's it's, uh, it's it's good to see that you see placement of students or internships as one part of this bigger picture. I think that's that's very helpful. And then it doesn't just start, as you said, at the end, like here. Now you need to go for an internship. This is something we need to start at the very beginning of a student's life cycle. It, it is. Okay. Experiential education is absolutely essential throughout the whole process because students don't know what it's like in many cases to work. So they need to understand what the world of work is like, too. Okay. And um, why should an education institution invest in career services? What, like, why is it so important? Because the other side of the argument is, well, we're going to provide them with the knowledge and skills and then that should be enough for them to go out into the world and figure out how to find a job with that. Well, number one, your competition may be providing better training than you are. And so you've got to make your students, you've got to have your students competitive uh, when they get into the marketplace. Um, a number of institutions at all levels are, are providing career services now, uh, now more than ever. And a student, this this cycle of, of understanding who they are, what they want, and, and what the world of work is like, it doesn't go away. I mean, they mm -hmm. will be doing this for the next 30, 40, 50 years. Right, right, yeah, exactly. They need to learn the skills of how to do that. It's a good point. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Um, Fundi, I'd like to come to you now and ask how you define career services and, and what career services you offer to students at, at your institution at the different stages of, the, of their life cycle. Thanks, Amy, and um, good afternoon to our audience. Um, in the South African context, we tend to use the terms interchangeably or at various um, institutional types, it's used differently. For an example, in traditional universities, career services is um, the same, more or less, as what we in the University of Technology space would call it. Um, how, we, how I define career services is a service, I think much like what Jim has just said, um, a service where we help students to develop soft skills in essentially to prepare students for the world of work, but it's not just about bring me your CV and I'll get you a job and that's the end of it, but it is journeying with the students um, from the time that they're at university until they are in a world of, in, in, a, in the world of work. So that is how I define it. Sorry, I missed your second part of the question. Uh, and the second part is, and, and how, what, what um, services do, does your institution, your, your University of Technology, offer to students at the different stages of their life cycle, you know, when they first come in as freshmen until they actually graduate? Oh, okay. Thanks for that. The, first of all, I think it's critical to, to, to indicate that the assistance of career services to students should not just be a bolting on service, but it should be um, from the beginning of the student's career. So at our university, we've got what we call the first year experience program. And this is a generic program that is designed to help the student ease into university. But what we've done is we've piggy piggybacked with that program. So we bring in an introduction of the skills that the student will need through university 
but will also need when they are out in the workplace. So that is the, the, the first year experience. We basically play with the students and introduce them to teamwork, introduce them to planning and organizing their work, but in a very fun way. Then in the second, in their second year, our students, the second year for the for the for the majority of our students, the second year is literally the last year that they are on campus because in the third year going out to do their work integrated learning. So in the second year, we run a fully fledged um, work readiness program, which is a 15 week program. It's um, it's non credit bearing, but it is formalized and mm -hmm. through this program, we teach students, we introduce students to the world of work, to organizational um, protocols and communications, and we bring in the softer skills in a much uh, broader way than what we did in the first year. We, 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 we use our, our work readiness is offered um, as a combination of theory, a little bit of theory, but with um, a, a major part of it being a simulation. And then in the third year, of course, then the students are out in the in um, in, in industry for their work integrated learning. In this space, the readiness preparation of students for the world of work continues through a supervision, supervised work integrated learning, um, reflections, encouraging our students to really reflect on what am I doing, why am I doing it, and we get and that those are the services that we offer our students. Of course, there are other additional services like your consultation or CV writing, because CV writing is offered as part of the 15 week program, but we also run consultations because a student may have forgotten or they may be needing that confidence to say, is my CV right? So we offer that service as well. Thanks, Amy. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Fundi. That's very helpful. And and uh, here I want to ask you in your capacity as General Secretary for SASCI, is this the kind of um, uh, consultancy that you would offer your members? Do they do they come to you when they have a problem? Do they come to you when they decide to set up a, uh, edu uh, a career services unit? How, how does it work? All right. We've... Um... As SASCI, we have positioned ourselves as an association that will assist our members with establishing um, or even starting at conceptualizing their mm -hmm. career services so that they understand the models that they need, that, that they can use and, and the staffing and everything. So it is an um, it's a service that we 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 have as part of our offering. We don't need um, as much to be doing it for universities of technology because with them, this service has been there for a long time. But we are we are looking at holding our member TVET institutions, um, holding their hands, um, working with them through this whole journey. OK, that's great to know. And I'm sure our audience uh, is interested in, in, in hearing that. And we will come back to that and the challenges in, in South Africa. But on this topic of setting up a, a career services unit, um, Jim, I wanted to come back to you uh, from your perspective and your experience in, in, in the US and elsewhere. Could you talk us through the full career services offering? Uh, what 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 that would look like so in, for our audience to think about the different steps. Sure. Well, at the in the beginning, a very fundamental start is getting a student to do their self assessment. Uh, they can do this through a number of different uh, manners, but they need to rank order, identify their interests, their values, uh, what's important to them, what kind of and <laughs> what kind of work they want to do, uh, type of people they want to work with, and get a good sense of uh, where they can best make a contribution. And so that's the very start. Once they mm -hmm. understand themselves better, the next step is understanding what is in the marketplace. You know, most research shows that uh, all students have a pretty uh, focused idea of what 
their career opportunities are when there's probably 10 times as many career opportunities, but they just haven't been exposed to them. So they have to understand what is out there in the marketplace. What is the marketplace? Where do you find these positions? Um, A lot of research says a lot of positions are never posted on job boards, but they're out there. Uh, The next step is understanding how to communicate to potential employers, Uh, putting together, obviously, a CV, resume. Uh, Very importantly, in today's world, I think, is putting together a polished LinkedIn profile and understanding how to use LinkedIn. Because mm-hmm. LinkedIn LinkedIn is a fabulous source of information uh, on, a num- on a number of different fronts. Uh, and and then once they understand how to use that, then it's moving out and talking to a lot of people about their jobs. What do they like? What do they dislike? What do they wish they studied? So forth and so on. And doing what we call informational interviewing or career services. And then understanding towards the end of the process in an ideal world how to evaluate the job offer understanding Mm -hmm. what benefits what the ambiance is like who they would be working with what they would learn in the process what opportunities would come after that that particular internship experience or or full-time role so it's a very systematic way to look Mm -hmm. at this and again as i mentioned before this goes on again and again and again in the life cycle of a, an individual's career because all the parts are moving. The marketplace is changing. Their, their skills that they learned at school five years ago are now out of date. They have to update mm-hmm. them. And communication changes. So it's an ongoing process, which is why it's so important to embed it into the education. Right, right. Because, yes, we're hearing statistics about how many jobs uh, one individual is now going to have during their career. It's not one or two anymore. It's something like 15. So you need to stay on it. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, And I just wanted to go back to your point, uh, the first analyzing skills and their interests and their values. Uh, I wanted to pick you up on this and, and said, it, uh, ask, does this really matter what their interests and values are? I mean, is that what an employer is going to be focusing on, uh, it, their interests? Or is it more about mainly their what they can do, their degree and, and, and the skills they've learned? It's definitely about the skills. Mm-hmm. But for the individual, they can, uh, 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 the skills are important to the employer and they have to be able to understand how to communicate those skills or demonstrate that they've had those skills or exposure to them or hypothesize how they would would uh, critically think about particular problems in, in their position. But all of the research has shown that interest and values and what motivates individuals are overall more important than skills because their skills the skills that they have and the skills that they'll need five and ten years from now are going to be changing but they do have to have that baseline of skills and demonstrate their energy demonstrate their motivation to future employers understand how to demonstrate that on paper and by email in person uh, over the telephone uh, to be successful so it's 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 both if you don't have the skill set the employer is not mm-hmm. going to talk to you but if you understand what motivates you mm-hmm. then you you can generate a number of options and then have options mm-hmm. hopefully to choose from i see i see okay that that's very helpful um uh, just quickly here, and I, because I got caught, uh, I got uh, uh, interested into the, in the discussion, you know, of Jim and Fundy, I forgot to go back to our poll. So just to go, uh, just to summarize on that, there's 10% of the audience that don't have any um, career advisory units. 
um, mo the majority, 50%, lie in the area of where no um, career advisory unit, but where they offer ad hoc uh, services, and and 40% have a have a have a unit. Um, so let me just confirm to everybody you're in the in the right place. We are going to be talking about going further into what uh, what what some resources on what you can share, um, how that would be useful for you. Before we do that, though, I, I wanted to ask you, Fundy, um, what challenges you see in South in the South African market when it comes to setting up a career services unit or a cooperative education unit to help students get a job? Um, and obviously, work integrated learning is, is one part of that. Um, so what, what would you say? Oh, thanks, Amy. All right. Um, I think one of the major challenges in the South African context is funding of the career services units. In our spaces, particularly in the University of Technology space, um, work integrated learning, um, which is the, sole, the, the one big reason why our cooperative education units exist, is not a funded program through the Ministry of Higher Education and, and Innovation, Science and Innovation. And the impact that that has is that it puts universities in an awkward space, universities of technology, in an awkward space in that they have to make a decision of we're going to set up the unit anyway and then we're going to fund it out um, on our own because we're not going to get any funding or we, we're not going to do it any um anywhere um you know we're just not gonna do it and that is one of the major reasons and and uh, the major challenges and this has a rippling effect because obviously it comes down to if you decide you're going to have a career services office how are you going to resource it and mm -hmm. what you mm -hmm. would then find is that our these these types of of uh, of services are usually thinly resourced, um, where you would find, for an example, in my office, I think about we're only about five staff members. That includes myself and my secretary. So really, people that are on the ground, there's just about three people. Mm -hmm. And that is the, that seems to be the picture across all universities of technology. So one would say a major challenge is the funding. Um, so, yeah, I think I'll I'll keep it mm -hmm. there, Amy, because okay. all other problems emanate from that. Right, right, right. And, and do you see any difference in the challenges faced by universities of technology and TIVITS? Because you 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 did talk about how um, that they 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 are in slightly different situations. It could be that there, there's potential for differences between um, the challenges that we experience in UOTs and what TVETs experience. That solely comes um, into in the it comes from the funding model. Um, our understanding is that the government does pump in a lot of money into the TV space or more money into the TV space than mm -hmm. what they do to our to the universities of technology. I'm now speaking in particular towards the work integrated learning component. And therefore, the, the, the potential for differences is that they, the, the TVs could have a bit more um, financial resources than what we have. But generally, because the money comes and it's not like say, it's not labeled as uh -huh. this is for work integrated learning. An institution could use the money for whatever else that it does. And the, another difference is that universities of technology are autonomous in nature. So mm -hmm. the Senate could decide we're going to go with the work integrated learning component and therefore establish a cooperative education unit and fund it in this particular manner. But in terms of the TVETs, the difference is that the TVETs are kind of, they fall directly under the Ministry of um, Higher Education, Science and Innovation. And therefore, in a way, they're not autonomous and um, mm. decisions may come from the top in terms of 
this is how you are going to use the money or you will have this unit or you will not have this unit. If you have it, this is the way that you will run it. And I think that's that could be a, a difference. OK, thank you. Thank you for that. And I think that's that's going to really help clarify things in the minds of, of the audience here on that. OK, so given that the main challenge in South Africa is is the funding, which is um, maybe even more restrict, even more so than other countries, but a common uh, restriction. Um, Jim, um, can I come back to you and could we go through the four phases you explained earlier of how uh, an education institution can help a student and and maybe guide uh, guide uh, our audience to um, resources that uh, or guide our, our audience to how to do this with limited funding, perhaps some um, low cost uh, resources that are out there. Sure. Well, when you when we talk about self assessment, uh, interest, values, motivators, so forth. There are a number of uh, free resources, a uh, laundry list of skills where students can go through a laundry list of values where they can go through 30 or 40 values and prioritize them. And at, at the end of this, uh, I can provide some some resources or after after the presentation today. Uh, the same with um, uh, interest. Uh, mm -hmm. Also identify identifying skills, understanding the broad array of skills, understanding how to articulate them, and then again, prioritizing. These are skills that I have that I can demonstrate. These are skills that I want to acquire and how they're going to acquire them. Uh, there are some a couple of books out there. Uh, mm -hmm. What Color Is Your Parachute for College is a fabulous book. It recently uh, just came out again in the 2023 edition. Um, and uh, I think getting a copy of that and using the number of the exercises, um, educators can provide them to students. Uh, there are other free resources that mm -hmm. educators can literally go to websites uh, at Vanderbilt. They have a, a free 150 page resource called Color Your Career. Mm -hmm. uh, the Columbia University has a 100 page resource walking students through and educators through all of these steps and you can download that off of their website. So is that in terms of self assessment, there are a lot of ways to do some of that. There's also some some paid assessments, but I don't think uh, they're necessary. In terms of market assessment, um, understanding where the jobs are posted, understanding who are the top organizations in your region, uh, understanding who's doing the hiring. I think, again, uh, going to websites, Googling free information, talking to chambers of commerce is, uh, are, is a way to get a list of who is hiring. Also, LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the best thing that has happened to our industry. And most universities, colleges, community colleges have a page on LinkedIn and there will be alumni listed on those pages where students can see who is working in a field from their college or their Tibet uh, and reach out to them and ask them, what is it like to do this type of job? So there's a number of ways to go out and figure out what is going on in the marketplace. Uh, and then this this presentation piece, and that goes back to LinkedIn again, but going back to your your resume, your CV, uh, is, is also very, very important to really put it together well with an objective in mind of who do you want to read this and get excited about reading your CV or your resume? It's just not a data dump of everything you might have done. If it's a data dump of everything you've done, it, it, it's not a marketing document with a clear objective. And so learning how to put that together, uh, both LinkedIn profile and CV and res or resume is, is really, really critical. And then finally, uh, working in presentation skills, and we may get into this a little bit later, but uh, communicating with their peers, with their fellow students, with their colleagues, 
and and telling them that they're interested in certain fields and finding out what information they can get from their colleagues. It's almost do, like doing crowdsourcing with your peers is one way to get information. And then doing the same thing with alumni, with people who, who are out there doing what you believe you might want to do and working on your presentation. Okay. So okay. I think I think I walked through most of that. Okay, yeah, and I'd like to dig into some of the details because this is this is excellent. So on step one, you were saying that there are there are a couple of books out there that would really be helpful for career service coaches, and some free uh, online uh, tests for that students can take for on interests and 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 skills. And I'd like to assure the audience that what we're going to do is after this webinar, we will include, we'll take that list from you, um, Jim, and we'll include it in the email we send out to you. So that's that that's that's great. Digging a bit deeper into the the market assessments and what um, career advisory coaches can do uh, in that area. Uh, you mentioned obviously talking to chambers of commerce and and linked LinkedIn. So can we go into a bit more detail of of what they can what uh, career service um, advisors can do systematically? I mean on LinkedIn, uh, you were saying this is one of the best things uh, that's happened in this space in this field. Uh, would it be a matter of like putting together a database based on your alumni using LinkedIn and then getting in touch with them? Like, what are some low hanging fruits that uh, they can do with limited resources to 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 move on this? Sure. Well, well, there's a two page document that LinkedIn has, and we'll put this in the resources, which walks a, a student or any professional through how they should set up their LinkedIn profile and, and highlights how best to do that. Um, there's also, um, as I look at this whole world, there, there's two superpowers. We as educators need to teach our students. One is having a polished LinkedIn profile, knowing how to use LinkedIn. And the other is understanding how to have career conversations, which are very different uh, conversations in, in terms of getting ready to prepare to have these conversations. Another phrase that's used is informational interviewing. So if, if we can empower students to do both, to have those two superpowers, they'll take off, they'll go. Mm -hmm. And I've got a, a six page document that talks about how to have a career conversation that we can also uh, provide for our audience. Uh, well, that would be great. Yeah. So, so, uh, and then if if I was king, if I was in charge of the world at any educational institution, I would make having a LinkedIn profile mandatory mm -hmm. for every student, because once you once they have a LinkedIn profile and there are over 800 million people with LinkedIn profiles around the world, you can track that student. You can track them as an alum. You could at any point in time, because most people that have profiles keep them up, you can in 20 seconds find out where your students, where your alumni are, what industry they're in, what function they're in, what majors they might have had, uh, and track them forever. OK, so so if I was king, that's what I would do. <laughs> OK, OK, that sounds like a, a, a good piece of advice there, an easy one to make sure that your students have that. And then we'll be sharing some resources then on how to set that up, because obviously they would need some advice on that. OK, and um, going going back to the restricted resources um, and here we'd be connecting with alumni is is there a, a way to um, let's say leverage uh, alumni or anyone else in the institution to help provide these services because as Fundy was saying that they're really restricted you know if you have three three people and all these students coming in we're going to push them to come in and ask questions Who, who's going to deal with this any ideas there Jim well, I, 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 in my experience, people love to talk about themselves. Okay, <laughs> so especially when they're approached from about their profession, 
and the challenges that they've got and the experience that they've had. And this is why I think if we can get students, empower them in, in a, a normal professional way to reach out and ask questions of, of individuals uh, about their jobs and their careers, I find that uh, an alum will speak to 80% of the time to a student and they'll think they had a fabulous conversation because they were talking about themselves. And I say this in a very positive way because people, most people do want to give back. They most they want to learn from their, they want to take their hard earned experience and, and help others, you know, help pull them up. So not only one on one having empowering students to talk, but but bringing, I think uh, educators can bring a panel of alumni in, in a certain industry or a certain function. And frankly, I think the younger, the better. You know, someone out five years, not someone out 25 years because they start pontificating mm -hmm. a little bit. But but they they know what it's like to get a job and keep a job and keep moving in the organization. And and bringing a panel of two or three people in uh, can certainly, you know, there's no, there's no real cost there or having a webinar and, and, and having students ask questions uh, is a great way to utilize the alumni. And the alumni love it. They love to give back. Okay, alumni, using your alumni. Okay, at this point, I think I want to ask the audience because this sounds like a really uh, low cost way of bringing in a lot of uh, uh, help and experience. Uh, does your college utilize alumni for career advisory supports? Yes, you have a formal system. Yes, you engage alumni, but in an ad hoc, ad hoc way or, or no? you don't engage alumni for career services. Um, that would be interesting to hear from you all on how, how you, uh, whether you engage with alumni or not. And while we wait uh, for that, uh, maybe again, I'll go into um, the last point you made. So on, on presentation skills, as you said, we are, we're gonna be sharing um, this, uh, resource on how to set up a LinkedIn profile, which, as you're saying, uh, Jim, would be like one of their superpowers. Um, what about managing a, a career conversation? And and I, and I know you're going to share a resource, but just to give an idea here, let's say I want to be a manager in a car factory. I've studied yeah, you know, I've been a technician. I, that's what I want to do. Um, or maybe I want to go work for government, be a civil servant. Uh, how how would I go about? Like, can we use this example about how I would go about doing this so that career advisory coaches can have this in mind while they're advising their students? Sure. Well, I I, I would go to LinkedIn and find an individual who's working in the government for the last five, six, seven, eight years, and send them an email and there's a number of ways to find their emails or you can also go through linkedin mm -hmm. when you send them an email say hi i'm a second year student at this tivit and i'm very interested in spending 20 minutes at your convenience having a conversation learning what the challenges and the great experiences are in your role do not send your cv do not send your resume but Having a polished LinkedIn profile in your signature in the email, you put your LinkedIn URL. And, and this person is going to say, Mary Smith, I have no idea who Mary Smith is. And they're going to click on the LinkedIn profile. They're going to see your picture. They're going to see what you're studying, what your experiences are. And they're going to think, I can give you 20 minutes. I wish I had talked to someone with my experience five years ago, that would have really helped me out a lot if I had a chance mm -hmm. to have done that. Sure, so I'll talk to you for 20 minutes. When the student gets an acceptance, and I would say one out of three times, if they persist and they follow up a week mm -hmm. in a second week, one out of three times they'll be successful. As Soon as someone says yes, they write down 10 questions and they write them down. And the questions are not, how did you get there? Because they've seen this on the person's LinkedIn profile. The questions are, I see you were studying mechanical engineering, and now you're in the policy area of government. What skills helped you make segue into that part of the gov government role? And 
what do you wish you had studied that would make you even better at that role in the future? So the questions in the first 10 seconds, your initial questions indicate you've done your research, you've done your homework, and you're really interested in knowing what's going on. You probably won't get through those 10 questions, but you set your phone or you set a clock for 19 minutes and at 19 minutes you stop and say, hey, I only asked for 20 minutes. In my experience, if you're having a good conversation, people will give you a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the conversation, you say, thank you so much. I've learned this and this and this. And by the way, now that you know a little bit more about me as a student, who would you recommend I speak to next? And at that point, what you want to hear is, you know, you remind me of a classmate. Here's her email address and let her know that I recommended that you should talk to her. That's what you want to hear. That's the concept of networking, of mm -hmm. building up your professional profile. And if, if you get a response saying, hey, I'm sorry, I only have 20 minutes, I got to go. That's kind of like a grade that said you really weren't as prepared as you might have been and think through that conversation again. Maybe prepare better questions. Then you build up your network and then keep a list of everybody you talk to. And you should be doing this every single month, if not every couple of weeks. And at the end of your school year, when you've got a position, you send an email back to the individual and say, hey, thank you. I want to let you know I've landed in this role and your conversations and recommendations were really helpful to me. And you've made a friend for life. You made a professional friend for life, and that's part of your network. And you keep keep in touch with those people. OK, so that's a very succinct way of going Got about it. Got it. I'm really looking forward to getting the how to have a career conversation. I think that's really going to help. I'm taking notes here. I think the audience will find that very helpful, too. Just one thing on that, Jim, before I, I want move back to Fundy. Um, I think the main thing that would stop people from doing that, and I'm thinking myself, is rejection. Like somebody rejects, uh, says no, or just doesn't under doesn't respond, um, or yes, yeah, says something like that. Uh, okay, you know, I've got to go now. Uh, what What's your advice of dealing with this rejection? Because I would imagine that would be the most, the biggest barrier for people. Well, at first, when we started this 10, 15 years ago, students would say. Ooh, this is creepy. I don't think I could do this. It's not creepy anymore. But re if you're not getting rejected, you're not trying. If you want to optimize your career opportunities, you will get turned down. Frankly, worse than rejection is not hearing anything at all. Yeah. This is this is why our recommendation is you send an email, you follow up a week later with another email, and if you need to follow up a third time, do it. And I know most professionals if they get three emails from someone, they say, eh, I think it's going to be easier just to respond to the <laughs> student. <laughs> and the hit rate, as I said, is probably one out of three, maybe 40 percent. And that's that's going to be your hit rate. But that that will be good enough. And again, if you're not getting rejected, you're not trying, you're not being persistent. And part of this is demonstrating how you're going to work in an organization. So your persistence, your resilience, your grit, your determination, you're demonstrating this by your actions. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. it's yeah. it, it's all good. And yes, you're going to get turned down. In the four or five thousand people I've talked to over 20 years, I've asked the question: How many times people told you to go jump in a lake? Don't ever call me again. I've had three. That's it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. OK, so, yeah, be open to rejection. It's it's fine. And to being ignored, it's just part of the journey. Um, I'm just going to say here that, that we have the answers, uh, the responses to our polls. So 76 percent of the audience don't engage alumni for, for career advisory support. So um, uh, that's a, a, a big tip you've offered here, Jim. So maybe this is is one one way, everyone, to move forward uh, with 15 percent engaging in an ad hoc way. Um, 
uh, here I'd like to come back to you, Fonti. So after hearing, uh, you know, these resources and about these resources and, and advice from from Jim on on how to address this restricted the restricted funding and restricted staff, I wanted to ask you if you had anything to add to this, any further advice for the audience, uh, and and obviously feel free to comment on on anything Jim has said here and and its relevance in in the context of South Africa. All right. Um, thanks, Amy. I think what uh, I could add is one of the other very, very um, helpful um, hints, tips is to form partnerships to 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 really um, get those partnerships with industry going. Hmm. Not necessarily only for placement of students at that particular time, but for saying, look, um, in our final year, we'd like you in, in our in the final year of our students, we'd like you to come on board and talk to students, to, um, invite people to come and give lectures. That is the way that you form these partnerships and you build on the partnerships. You also be, you also get to understand you. We must first understand that mm -hmm. we producing students that are going to be entering industry. So that is their destination. And therefore, the destination needs to tell us what is it that they want? Mm -hmm. How are our students doing with them? And engage with us in how we can correct whatever is not right. In that way, you give them ownership suddenly they are no longer the recipient of your students, but they are partners. They are mm -hmm. partners in preparing the students for the world of work. So in my institution, I have an annual work integrated learning engagement. In Isizulu, we call it IMBISO. And that's really just an informal gathering. We invite our employers and we talk about what is it that our students are lacking. And through those engagements, we have improved our work readiness tremendously because then they tell us your students are good technically, but they lack ABC. And this is how we suggest that you correct that. And we've even started now to say, well, you want us to correct this. Let's be partners in correcting this. So that is very, very critical. Um, inviting them to come and do career talks is also very important. I think Jim spoke to it, spoke, spoke to that. In my institution, we, we ran a, we got a slot in the, in the campus radio and we invited uh, professionals. Every week we would have a professional that would come in and say, how do you brand yourself? And they start to talk about that. And um, in the next week, they talk about the importance of a good CV. And we find that that keeps our relationship with industry. So that is very, very um, important. One other thing that I think is very, very critical as a career services office or a cooperative education office is to strengthen your advisor, the advisory boards, the industry advisory boards, um, so that they can have input into what we are teaching, what the university is teaching technically, and also help you to access industry. So suddenly you're not only relying on this on the limited staff in the office, but you also have feet out in industry. And these are people that could say in their place of work, oh, you're looking for a student. No, 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 I can put you through. Um, you know, I can put you in contact with this type of person. I don't think I can emphasize the importance of industry advisory boards um, enough. So yes, I think those are some of the tips that I could um, that I could I could bring in. I think also at a certain stage in our, in our engagement, we had spoken about the value of using interns in mm -hmm. the office. That's also the part of strengthening your resources. Um, mm -hmm. So whilst I have a permanent staff complement of five, I, the staff complement in my office is about 10 because 50% of that is interns. You're going to spend a lot of time training them, but 
once you've trained them well, they can run. I could have an I could have an intern running, um, you know, hosting an employer that is on campus doing interviews from getting the students to know that they have an interview and setting up the venue and look, looking at the hospitality. And those are some of the creative ways that we we boost our resources. OK, that's great. Thank you, Fondi. So two more tips here, leveraging obviously industry by bringing them in as a partner so they they can help you with this and students. And I would imagine like alumni, they're very happy to engage on on this, right? They they turn into employees. <laughs> uh, that's that's great. OK, so now um, I think it's time to turn to our q and I have seen some hands in the audience and may I ask you, because we, we don't have the facility for audience members to, to, to speak up, but could you write your questions in either the chat or the Q&A? And the Q&A, by the way, is um, private, so on, only uh, the speakers and myself can, can see that. Um, so just for the people with their hands raised. Um, I'll be waiting for your questions in the chat or the Q&A box. Uh, but for the questions that we already have, so we have one first question here, and I think I'll, I'll ask Jim first, because this is about the process that you set out um, uh, of, of first analyzing um, skills and then, and then looking at the market. And the question is, does this process work for graduates interested in setting up their own business because uh, many of our graduates need to do that given the lack of jobs and, and could you elaborate a little bit more on that i think it does because they they do have to understand what their values are and what motivates them and what their strengths are and be able to articulate that especially if they're going trying to get some funding from from a local organization or from an association or from a bank so they they have to understand uh, what the marketplace will support mm -hmm. and, and understand who their competition is. So I think walking through those steps, you can say, hey, I have a great idea. Well, a lot of people have great ideas. How are you going to implement it? And being mm -hmm. able to then communicate that, articulate that to potential customers, potential people who are going to fund them i think i think it still holds true in in, in that process for entrepreneurs okay, great and, and i would imagine on the interests as well right figuring out what you want to do yes yes um okay another question here is uh oh, oh maybe maybe actually i'll go to fundy before i move on that question um I get also for you on uh, what we've looked at here, the process you 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 uh, uh, illustrated. Does that also work for um, graduates that want to set up their own business? Any any additions you'd you'd like to add to to the way you you've been doing it at your university? All right, um, in our university, the entrepreneurship education is not as um, linked not linked to our unit as such it is a separate um it's it's a separate unit it's fairly new as well but what um what they then the university does is to engage um look at students and alumni that have businesses and get them on board i know mm -hmm. annually they run an exhibition of i'm doing catering so i'm gonna come on board I'm going to come to the open day and exhibit things that I do. So they so so we are it's fairly new, but we are mm -hmm. starting to really engage with them. But one of the things that one is trying to get to do, I work very closely with the entrepreneurship education coordinator um, solely because I believe that entrepreneurship education gives students the employability skills that they would need, whether they are running their own business or whether they are employed. So for me, I, I if again, if I was a the king or vice chancellor, I mm. would ensure that this happens in the, I, you know, in the same unit, because mm -hmm. you could be building up the student for both worlds. So mm. if the student has mm 
built up the required employability skills. They could go anywhere. If they are entrepreneurial in nature, they can go into entrepreneurship. So yeah, that's the that's us. Okay. That's us. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Fundy. And we have a couple more, uh, a few more questions here, so I'm going to try and move quickly. Um, one is, I think, uh, maybe that again directed at you, Jim, on analysing interests. It's how do you deal with psychosocial challenges that could have a negative effect impact on the student's confidence and becoming who they want to be? So maybe I'll ask Jim first and then also come back to you, Fundy, on, on your experience in this area. Yeah, I, I think my first rea reaction is uh, this is part of the maturing process that a student goes through when they're going through their education. And if I'm playing soccer or football, if I don't try to score, I'm not going to ever score. So a student has to get used to most of their kicks not going in the goal. And they have to just start building up their confidence. Uh, you know, it's uh, it, it's easier for to say and it's harder for some students to do it than others. But I, I think that's important to understand that you're going to get turned down. You know, finding a job is kind of like dating. I mean, you're going to ask a, a man or a woman out and they're, a lot of them are going to say no. And you've got to learn from that experience to then figure out what the market is is really like. OK. Getting comfortable with rejection again. I think yes. this, this this is a this turns out to be an important resilience here. Some resilience. Yes. OK, yes. OK. And uh, Fundy, uh, any any comments <laughs> on this? Yeah, on in in. On our side, as much as, yes, I agree 100% with Jim that students need to learn to build that confidence. Mm -hmm. I am I am in an institution where that is a major issue with our students because they come from deep rural areas. So mm -hmm. confidence levels are usually um, a challenge. I then work very closely with the counseling department so that if we see that there is maybe a confidence issue, we refer the student, um, even if it's just to say, look, um, can someone just please just chat to the student or to say to the student, look, you've been through so many interviews and you have not making it. Um, some of the employers have said to us there is a confidence issue and such. We recommend that you go to counseling just to check. The challenge, though, in our environment is that going to a counseling session is interpreted as though, you know, I am a bit, you know, there's something not right upstairs. So you start by saying to the student, the counseling unit is not for people that are not right upstairs, but it is held to help you in your journey. So we would refer them to that, um, refer them to the counseling unit so that they can talk about that. One of the things that um, employers in my last engagement, my 2022 engagement, have, yeah, have suggested is that we start um, teaming up with um, the Toastmasters so mm. that students can learn to talk and build that confidence so that is something that is in the pipeline um yeah that's that thank you for bringing that up and, and this is a really important point that we take into consideration that students have different backgrounds uh, depending on their background, their level of confidence is going to differ. On uh, yeah, uh, so that th that's that's a that's a very uh, that's a very good point, uh, Fundy. Thank you for that. And then Toastmasters, I think the good thing again about that one is that it's a free resource; anyone can join. So um, that's another good tip for our audience. I think we we have a, a time for one more question, if we can keep it brief, even though it's uh, a loaded one. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll start with you, Jim, maybe, uh, and then and then ask Fundy, who is responsible responsible for making sure that the curriculum is still relevant to the market? And obviously, careers, yeah, 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 it's a big one, but maybe very briefly before we wrap up. <laughs> Number one, the leadership of the educational institution should make, make sure it's relevant. Whatever you were teaching 10 years ago is probably not that relevant. Number two, I think bringing in the alumni 
we're looking at who might be of hiring some of your students, the larger organizations, and bringing them in and showing them the, the curriculum and, and having them respond to it, asking them what's lacking in there and when they go to hire people and what they have to train the people for, I think is a, re a really good way to keep it relevant. And Fundi had mentioned advisory boards. Uh, they're, they're, they're mixed because you want to take in all their information. You might not be able to respond to all of it right away, but advisory boards are also very helpful if you can institutionalize something like that. OK, great. Thank you, Jim. Uh, anything to mm. add, Fonzi? Yes, um, I think over and above what Jim has, has said, um, what I found works is running regular surveys. So we run surveys with our employers every three years to say, are these skills okay, I think Fundy is um, frozen for a second. I'll just give her a couple of seconds. I don't know, Fundy, if you can hear us, but we can't hear you. I don't, I'll, I'll just add and pick up where okay. are, the, are, the, okay. are these yeah. skills are these skills still relevant? And then also, again, what skills are you not finding mm -hmm. that you would like to find in the process from our from right. our students? Yeah. From the survey, yes, yes, and I think that's exactly the the, the points that uh, Fondi was making earlier and picking, uh, and that's what you would ask in a survey. Okay, well, we've come to an end. Hopefully, Fondi will un unfreeze in a second, but we've come to the end of our webinar. So we're, we're going to ha end there with some questions that we weren't able to get to, but I hope uh, everybody has uh, learned something and, and, and found this useful. I'd like to thank uh, our speakers, Fundy and Jim, for taking the time to share your knowledge. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining. Again, I hope you have some good ideas now on how to take uh, forward uh, your career services unit uh, in your institution. Uh, by the way, SASKI is uh, a, res a resource for, for South African institutions, so feel free to uh, reach out to um, uh, Fundi if you, if you have any, any questions about how they can help you. And if you would like more resources on the topic of employability in general, please web visit our website, uh, the IFC VT1, which will be is included in the emails we send out to you. Uh, there's also a free ben benchmarking exercise there that we think you might find helpful. So thank you, everyone, and looking forward to seeing you in our next webinar. Bye for now.